Fishburn for drumtalktv.com. Now, this was very unexpected. We have a wannabe drummer. We have Lone Friend here. Um, Lone, tell, tell, tell our viewers... Like, who I am? Who the hell are you? Are you a drummer? No. You, 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 I banged kudos on for pots this, but... and pans. I know this drummer. That one? Yeah, yeah. He wrote the foreword to my first book, Life on Planet Rock. Wow. Yeah. And it came out in 2006. I've written two books. But a lot of, most people know me from the 80s and 90s as the editor of Rip Magazine. Rip Magazine. And I had a segment on Headbangers Ball in America called Friend at Large. And I used to talk about all the stuff. <clears throat> Put Guns N' Roses on their first magazine cover. Uh, documented the making of the Black Record with Metallica. So I have a lot of stories. A few. Just a couple. And, uh, of we drum and I have a love for drummers. The guys that I've stayed in touch with over the last, like, 10 or 15 years where I've been off the grid just writing liner notes and books and things are mostly drummers Tommy okay. Lee and yeah. Lars and <coughs> uh, people like that okay cool Chad Smith who we just interviewed he was bouncing off the walls who's, uh, who's a friend from Los Angeles for many years I'm, I also have a cameo appearance in uh, the Funky Monks making of the Blood Sugar Sex Magic Red Hot Chili Peppers record I was invited by Rick Rubin to the studio, and the studio was housed in this mansion in Laurel Canyon, a venerable part of Los Angeles where a lot of music came from, from the 60s all the mm -hmm. way through to present. And they made this, in, this record inside what was called the Houdini House, right off of Laurel. And I, I got the call, you know, we want you to interview the band, but you have to come to us. We don't leave the house. We have the studio built here. We bring the food in. The kitchen is all done. So I went, and there, and as soon as I got there, Flea came up to me and said, you know, man, there's ghosts in this house, and I'm going to show you where they are. Sweet. Right on. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've done some traveling, and uh, I'm not a musician. I'm a writer. My dad's a piano player, but I inherited his movement of fingers, but I can't play a lick. But I've always had a great affinity for drummers. Going all the way back to Ringo Starr, who was my first hero as a drummer. Yeah. I mean, come right. on, right? And it's funny, too, because I went to several Ringo dates on the All-Star Jam Tour this year because my high school pal, Steve Lukather, a great guitar player. Steve. I yeah. went to high school with Toto, Toto the Picaro brothers, and Steve. I've known them my whole life. And Steve is now, you know, Ringo's lead guitar player on tour. Him and Todd Rundgren, such I think, a great band. And I think they just toured Australia too. Yes, I they, missed it. I yes, missed it. I was here. They did Australia, yeah. And they're going back to do more dates because Ringo just loves this incarnation of the All Star Band. Wow. So I guess you'd say I'm sort of this Forrest Gump type character who keeps sort of running until he gets tired. <laughs> and and, and, and <laughs> talk, talk to us about uh, Pirate Radio. Yes, I had a syndicated radio show from 92, 93 called Pirate Radio Saturday Night, and um, a lot of great times on that show, guests. I had the uh, Kiss Paul Stanley bachelor party live on air the night before he married, or a couple nights before he married Miss Pamela, who he's since divorced. <laughs> <laughs> no rock stars stay married, but that was, that was a fun night. Uh, Chris Cornell once called me from a plane. Uh, he goes, he, I said, I got my engineer says there's a phone call coming in, and I don't, I don't get the area code. And he goes, Well, it's Chris. I'm on a plane. And it was 1992, and it was early in the technology where you could dial um, the land from the from the sky. Wow. Now you can do fucking anything. You're on your laptop up in the, up there. But then that's old school. You know, there was no cell phones and emails. No internet. Yeah, I, I kind of like was grew up with those sort of writers that went out and traveled. I was never a critic. I felt better when I was in the belly of the beast, witnessing mm -hmm. things. Speaking yeah, of a great drummer moment, I sat uh, in in, in uh, Budapest, Hungary, the '91 Monsters of Rock. When Metallica was debuting the Black Record overseas, they toured it overseas before they brought it to America, and um, one of the, they were with Motley Crue, and 
me and Lars sat and watched Tommy Lee drum. We sat right behind the kit. And they shot some footage, Motley Crue did that, that tour, and it, it, I showed up getting teased and hazed in the Decade of Decadence home video. I did the liner notes to the record, Decade of Decadence, the Motley Crue record. Yep. But they came off the stage, and we went in the dressing room, and Lars said, fucking never seen anyone hit him so hard. <laughs> and that's how he would have said it as well, right? <laughs> you got that down. Well, one of the reasons why uh, Bob Rock was chosen to produce the Black Record, which launched Metallica into another uh, stratosphere, another orbit, <laughs> was because of the sound of the Dr. Feelgood record. It, it, uh, Lars and James were both really moved by the, the sonics of that record. It made up a little mountain in Canada through the late Bruce Fairburn studio. <clears throat> I visited uh, Little Mountain when they were tracking Dr. Feelgood. That was a cool trip. Wow. Yeah, I, I was up there a couple times when Bon Jovi made Keep the Faith, I was up there. That was the trip that Lollapalooza was on their first tour, and they had uh, first or second Lollapalooza, and I was in Vancouver with Motley, no, with Bon Jovi, and um, it was the Pearl Jam Soundgarden Ice Cube Lollapalooza. And so I get invited out, and I take... John and Richie to see the show and it's thundering and pouring rain and, and Eddie comes in on a motorcycle through the mud and he's swinging and I was just in heaven and Richie was digging it but John really didn't didn't dig it. <laughs> he, right. he, didn't, he, he, he didn't get grunge so much. I think he got the energy of grunge but it, he came from a different place. But me and Sam Bora had such a good time watching that. So these are odd stories that I have from having been you know, around and traveling and stuff. Amazing. So, I wish here. I could make this more drummer centric. Well, let's let's but. get to to uh, Led Zeppelin and um, and uh, John Bonham. Now, the, uh, have, have you met John, or have you no, met any I, of the? No, he was gone before I started working, and I started in '82. Uh, yeah, the the two drummers that were who were heroes of mine growing up that I never met were Keith Moon and John Bonham. <clears throat> uh, I did meet Zach Starkey, who does a great. Ringo Sun, who fills in yep. admirably. I saw the first gigs he ever did with The Who, because it, it was the 9-11 Heroes show in New York City when The Who just blew everybody out of the room with three songs. And that was when, that was when Zach, because that was early in the Zach days. Um, but you've, you've interviewed uh, Jimmy Page, yeah, apparently. In, and yeah, in 1993... You asked him one question? In 1993, Rip Magazine was, was going to do... We were doing a cover story on the David Coverdale, Jimmy Page union. Right. They, they, they had a record produced. They made it in Florida. I had been down to Florida, the Criterion Studios in Florida, to hear some of the mixes, and I got back to to LA and I said okay so let's do the cover story so Jimmy gets inducted into the rock walk on Sunset Boulevard at the Guitar Center where you put your hands in cement you know there's they have all that Smithsonian-esque uh, musician <coughs> saged stuff going on there and it was really kind of a proud night for me because I introduced Jimmy Page I read a, a letter I read a letter from Les Paul and then I introduced Jimmy Page. And shortly after that, <clears throat> we set up an interview to do the Coverdale Page story. It was, it was arranged at the Bellage Hotel on, off Sunset Boulevard, right on the Strip, not far, walking distance from the Rainbow and the Roxy. And um, as a journalist, as an interviewer, regardless of medium, radio, TV, or, I, I, re I rarely prepare. The only thing I prepare is like... I prepare my personality to be right. honest. And because I had had some, I was on the road with, with Jimmy Page and for a little while when, uh, when uh, Aerosmith played Donington in 1990. I spent some time on a tour bus with them. That's in my first book, and I'm not telling that story because you really should get my book to read that story because it's, it. it's such a gross, hilarious story. It's in the Aerosmith chapter, <clears throat> The Screaming Prophet from Life on Planet Rock. However, I, I was in, not so much intimidated, but I felt 
kind of honored that I was going to sit with Jimmy Page, but I didn't do a whole litany of questions. I wrote one question, and my theory, as somebody who really lets the, the chemistry and the energy drive the conversation, I went into with one question. And, and, and my one question to Jimmy was, and I was going to live or die off this question, it was, when Bonzo died, did you know it was over? And then I sat and I waited for his reaction. There was a pause. And then he, yeah, man, fuck, of course. And then he went into it. And my tape was rolling. And it was, like, effortless. Because that led to the next thought, which led to the next thought. And then it became a, a dialogue. And I did a, a proud of the cover story that I wrote. But I know some people think that's weird. That, well, why didn't you just like have 20 questions for me? Well, that's never been my style. And it, I, fa I, I do have, I have failed on a few occasions of uniting. But when you have somewhat, even a short relationship built, somebody, like I have so many in this business, that you rely on that. You sink or swim. I'm not a confrontation guy. I could never do that stuff. Not a critic. I can't do that stuff. I'm not tabloid. Right. The magazine, we made them, these artists, look like the heroes that the fans saw. The best pictures and the, the best graphics. I was very proud of that magazine for all the years that we were published. It should be. It was awesome. Yeah. And, 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 and you, you consider yourself a fan. Yeah, I'm a fan. First, that just wants to have a conversation. I'm right? a fan that wants to have a conversation. That wants, I'm a fan and a conduit okay. that wants to connect those fans who don't have the access that I've been blessed to have, connect them, let them inside, and, you know, protect the privacy, don't go to places that are uncomfortable, but let them learn about the essence of the music and the creative process. That's pretty much has been my theme most of my career. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing all that with us. Um, and my second book was called Sweet Demotion. And that's what we've been asking all the yeah. drummers is like, what can we look forward to coming out? So this is coming out? Well, no, my second book came out, my first book came out in 06. My second book came out in, in 2011. It was called Sweet oh. Demotion. Right. And it, it doc, the last chapter documents uh, working with Steven Tyler on his memoir at, just before he went into uh, rehab. And it was a very intimate tale about going to Sunapee, New Hampshire, sitting in his lake house with him, getting deep into the reading of his manuscript. And then it's a personal, intimate story. And then it's like my midlife memoir. It's like, what happened to Lon Friend? Because I analyze where I just kind of disappeared from the path. And it's a, it's a lost journey story, which is more important than the rock and roll anecdotes. It's, it's really honest. You, you, some people have a ride that just never stops. I had a tremendous pothole on the road less traveled. Right. I hit, I hit the pothole on the road less traveled. Let me tell you something. It's not bad. It gives you perspective. Wise words. Uh... And I have a podcast, which I'm very excited about. It's just me kind of like doing this. Okay. It's called Energize, the Lawn Friend Podcast. You can find it. And, um, in fact, it's coming up on the bottom of the screen right now. Energize the Lawn Fred podcast. I'm like a sci fi kid, like Star Trek, so it hit me one day. Scotty, energize. And then I'm going to transport people to places. It's just awesome. a, a geek from, you know, grew up in the 60s and 70s, so why not? Have you seen the new movie? Um, I was walking through Union Square. It was raining. I was feeling extremely romantic by myself. And uh, let's keep it clean. Keep I, it clean. I, yeah. I walked into the multiplex and I saw two movies, both of which that I really, really wanted to see Great Gatsby mm -hmm. and Star Trek. And I opted for The Great Gatsby, oh. which I'm glad I did. I will see Star Trek because mm -hmm. I watched the original show when I was 10 years old, the first three seasons. I could remember them sitting wow. on my floor. Yeah. It's like me with Doctor Who. Doctor Who! <laughs> Yeah, or the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right. Yeah. See, you're kind of a geek too. I am. Yeah. Although that was a little bit too sort of like I was a bit young. I didn't quite get that. Right. I was still kind of like into the Daleks and all that sort of stuff. Where'd you so. grow up? Sydney, Australia. Yeah. Okay. So 1991, I was flown by 
the record company to see the Screaming Jets yep. and Rat Cat. Oh, Rat Cat! Yeah, yeah. In Sydney, in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and it's ironic that I was there when NXS was playing, and I and I and I got to see NXS play arena show in in Sydney. I went to the Taronga Zoo, and I went to Bondi Beach. And Newcastle was a blast, and I got to know David Gleason, the lead singer, who was a character. And um, I have many, many friends in Australia. Yeah. I, I, love, I have friends in Melbourne. Lindy, my friend Lindy's a concert uh, promoter over there. Terrific place. I want to go back. I kind of miss it. To all our Australian viewers that are watching, although this is a worldwide, we yeah. we we um, we have over a million viewers already. Um, we've only wow. been going like you know short time. Rock um, is global. It is absolutely. It Music is global. Music is global. Yeah, drumming, us, drumming is global. That well, well, it's the oldest music. It's the tribal archetype of where dance, beats come from. Vocals, dance, vocals, and drums. You know, Stephen Tyler told me when we were talking about Woodstock. He goes, I was, I was on so much acid at Woodstock that I saw hot dogs drop out of helicopters. <laughs> I said, well, when did that happen? Right after the drum circle. Because, you know, Stephen is a drummer. He right. started as a drummer. He taught Joey I didn't Kramer know that. the Walk This Way beat. You're kidding me. Yes, yes. He, he is a drummer. Wow. And he's all about cadence and about beat. And when we got into the thing, he goes, Man, we were in Trump and they were, I don't even know who else was there, but there were like 11 of us sitting in a circle with hot dogs falling out of the sky. We were all on acid. That's why Stephen Tyler rushed. It's not so bad. The Lars was, was kind of more so on the money. I'm a little better at Lars, but both of them, I work on them. I'm not an impressionist. You've even got the, 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 not the position. An, you know, I'm not an impression. I really enjoyed Get Him to the Greek, too. His cameo was great. Yeah, yeah. Russell Brand. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm a universal lover of music and pop culture. Awesome. So, and awesome. uh, cool. Sydney, I hope to get back to Sydney someday. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time out. I know you're you know, here with some friends and, and you wanted to listen to, the, like, listen to that groove right now. Yeah. Well, this is something that is that this is something that you don't have to pull teeth just get any drummer do you want to do some zeppelin and they right. sit down at the kit and they they uh -huh. to a note they all grew up with these songs it's that's what's truly like i mean it's 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 ubiquitous ask any drummer well, well rock drummer what'd you grow up listening to john bonham john bonham what about go back and listen to those records, man? Yeah, I talk about the 1969 Forum show, the Zeppelin show at the LA Forum in, in, in my first book, because that is one of the most unbelievable performances ever captured on tape. Tape. There's no tape wow. anymore. There's no we're using, film anymore. We're using tape. There's no tape. It's all digital. Ah, uh, digital tape. A bit of digital tape. I don't know. <laughs> I'm old school. Young heart, old school. Love it. Love thank it. Thank you for your time. Lone, thank you so much yeah. for popping in and um yeah. and is she Australian too? She's not. She's not Australian, yeah. So this is uh uh yeah, and, and the guy who runs this, Dan Schinder, is uh, in uh, Vegas. So well, I, um, I wrote we're good Planet friends. Rock in Vegas. You wrote Planet Rock in Vegas. I wrote that book in Las Vegas. I, I exiled Vegas is in both my books. I spent three years there. I left LA in 2003. Three. I was there from uh, 03 to 06. Yeah, a long time. Awesome. Cool. Go well, we could desert. keep talking. Go to the desert to find who you are, man. Yeah. Get, the, get, the, get, the, the entourage, um, the wishing tree? No, the what's it called? Joshua tree? The Joshua tree. Well, that's that's that is past Palm Springs. That's where Graham Parsons and Keith Richards used to go and have fun. We don't endorse that sort of thing, but uh, climb a tree is all good. The muse, the muse arrives from a myriad of sources and places. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks very much. Thank you, man.